Welcome, Ephraimites, and Shalom. This is your host, Sister Donna Deckard, and this is the House of Ephraim Cradle of Hope Wednesday evening streaming. And I want to thank each of you for tuning in. And I have a few announcements I want to make. First of all, I want to remind you that this Friday is New Moon, okay? And uh, also, I want to let you know that we are going to begin to to uh, have our Friday night Shabbat uh, on YouTube rather than on Zoom and on YouTube. So it will be available on the YouTube ch uh, uh, channel, Jewish Prophet, and that is with Mark, Prophet Mark Leinbold. Our blog talk radio is five days a week with the late Prophet Deckard and myself. And then we have the other station with Prophet Gary Burpee on Tuesday, Prophet Greg Burpee on Thursdays. And we are going to be having a Sukkot in Cassopolis. For those of you who need to know, uh, it will be, the campsite will be the $25 a night as it was two years ago, which is going to be terrific. At least that's something that didn't raise. Well, let's uh, begin. We're going to start a new uh, series tonight called The Pearl of great price. But let's start with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you and I praise you, Father. I thank you and I praise you. Praise you. you are an awesome God. Father, I lift this service up to you. And I ask, Father, for your anointing to flow. I lift it up to you. And Satan, I bind you from this service. I bind you from the hearts of those who would be listening. And Father, I thank you. I thank you and I praise you, Father that what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Lord, I send forth the angels. I send forth the angels to cause that anointing to flow. In Yeshua's precious name, amen and amen. The pearl of great price. The pearl of great price. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, 45 through 46. Yeshua is teaching here what the kingdom of God is like. So let's look in 45, Matthew 13, 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who when he found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. Now, I want you to think about this. Yeshua is talking about what the kingdom of heaven is like. He says it's like a merchant man. Now, a merchant man is someone who buys the the product that they sell in their store. Okay, and this merchant was looking for pearls. Now, I like pearls. I, I like them. I love to go to a jewelry store and look at the pearls. Okay? And the pearls are costly. Now, they have synthetic pearls now, and they have, have saltwater pearls, and they're different prices. But the goodly pearls, the goodly pearls, they are the expensive ones. It says when he found not a pearl necklace, but one pearl. He found one pearl that was very, very expensive. It was so expensive 
that he went and sold all that he had to buy it. Now, if he had a store full of merchandise, he sold all that merchandise so he could buy that one pearl. And Yeshua said, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is that one pearl. That one pearl that is so perfect. That one pearl that you should decide that you want so badly that you'll give up all, you'll sell everything else out for it. And that is what this merchant did. Yeshua said the kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like this. Let's go to Matthew 16. Yeshua is, is still teaching, okay? From that time forth, Yeshua began to show his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be killed and raised again on the third day. Yeshua is telling them, look, I am going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things at the hand of the church of the day. And I'm going to be killed. But on the third day, I'll rise again. Verse 22, we're in Matthew 16. Then Peter took him. And began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. I can just hear it. He is telling Yeshua, You can't speak that, that's not faith. You're speaking death and destruction. How could you do that, Yeshua? You've taught us about faith. Far be it from you. It's not going to happen to you. Peter was there when they tried to capture Yeshua and he walked through the crowd. Peter was only doing what you and I would do. Someone gets a report from the doctor. You have, you have a sickness and it's going to kill you. And you only have X amount of, of time to live. And we, just like Peter, that be far from you. We have faith to believe for you to live. And that's faith. But Yeshua, Yeshua turned to him and he said, Peter, Get behind me. Satan, thou art an offense to me. Lord, I was just I was just speaking faith. Don't call me the devil. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Can you imagine how confused the disciples were? I mean, Yeshua was at the height of his ministry. He had people coming from far and wide to hear him. And he was teaching them about the kingdom of God and they were learning things. And how, how could it be that he was going to die? And now Peter has rebuked him and Yeshua's called Peter the devil and told him you don't savor the things of God but those of men. You 
And Yeshua said to the disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. What? Whosoever will save his life will lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. That don't make sense, Yeshua. But you see, Yeshua understood the pearl of great price. Yeshua was predestined to be the Lamb of God. That sacrificial Pesach lamb. He was predestined to come and to suffer and die for our sins. His flesh didn't want to do it. We know that because he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. God, if this cup can pass for me, But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. His flesh didn't want to go through it, but he knew that was the pearl. That was what the kingdom of God was for his life here on earth. And Peter, Peter was coming against what was predestined for him. And he rebuked him. And he said, get behind me, Satan! For you don't savor the things of God, but of men. You see, we love our life. We want to protect our life. We want, it is, it is ingrained within us to try to live forever and ever and ever and ever. But we have a purpose and a reason to be here on this earth. And when God is done with us, it's time to go home. When our job is finished, it's time to, it's time to check out. He said, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you will lose your life for my sake, for God's sake, you will find it. The pearl of great price. When you find that pearl, when you find out what it is that you have been predestined to do here on this earth, when you find the, what it is that God wants you to be doing. You see, when, when I found out that we were to keep Shabbat, it was like a pearl of great price to me. I had to change everything as to how I thought. Saturday was the day to go run errands. Saturday was the day to clean house. Saturday was the day to do this and do that. And all of a sudden, Saturday wasn't the day to do those things. And my flesh was like, but this is the only day. How many of you, how many of you have experienced looking for something and it's only on sale on Saturday? And how many of you have fallen into the trap of, well, God, the ox is in the ditch. It's only on sale on Saturday. I got to buy it. Well, why don't 
you use your faith? Why don't you say, you know what, God? That is on sale on Saturday. I am not going to break Sabbath, but you are going to find me a deal for that on a day I can buy. Whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. Will find it. When you find that pearl of great price, you are going to have to sell out to God. You are going to have to give everything to him. Everything. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Let's go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 16 through 26. Behold, one came to him saying, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? And Yeshua said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good, that is, but God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said, which? And Yeshua said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said to him, All these things I've kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? All these things I've kept from my youth up. What do I lack? What do I lack? You see, this young man had had a spirit of religion. He'd been doing he'd been doing it all of his life, and I don't. I am. I'm good to go. Twenty one, and Yeshua said to him, If Thou will be perfect. Go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. You see, he was not willing to sell out to God. Now, this doesn't mean that you go sell everything you have. That's not what Jesus was saying here. You see, Yeshua knew the spirit that he was dealing with. This man was keeping the commandments, but he had a heart problem. His heart was wrong. And Yeshua knew what would fix that heart problem. And it says he went away sorrowful. And Yeshua, verse 23 Yeshua said to the disciples, Verily, verily, I say to you, a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's not talking about a needle that you sew with thread. He's talking about the door, the gate to the city, when they closed those big doors, they had a small door that they could open that you could go in and out of. 
but it was such a small door that the camels had to get down. And it would take, it would take quite a process to get that camel through that door. He said, it's easier for the camel to go through that door, and they called it the eye of the needle, than it is for a rich man. He didn't say it was impossible. But he said, it's easier than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why? Why? Because we get selfish with our possessions. Because we allow our possessions to become God to us. And again, I'm not saying you can't have possessions. Look at, look at Abraham. Look at Job. Look at David. Look at Solomon. Look at some of these men in the Old Testament. It would say they were the richest. God's not against you having riches. He says, I want to bless you. But when you are all wrapped up in your things, you're not sold out to God. And that was what was going on with this young man. Oh, he went to synagogue every week. He said his prayers he kept the commandments. What more could God want him to do? But he had a heart problem. He wasn't sold out to the kingdom of God. He wasn't willing to sell all that he had and purchase this pearl of great price. And when the disciples heard it, they, and I want you to listen to this, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? you got to remember, he's talking to, to Jewish people here, some of the richest people in the world. And they're going, who can be saved then? And Yeshua beheld them and said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are impossible. You see, God deals with your spirit, man. He deals with your heart. When you sell out to God, when you are willing to make God number one in your life. You will lose your life, but you will find it. You will lose your life, but you will find it. Why? Because God wants to bless you. God wants you to, God wants you to be without any need. Let's look at, at uh, verse 21 and 22 in the Amplified Bible. And Yeshua answered and said, If you would be perfect, that is, have that spiritual maturity which accompanies self-sacrificing character. Go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and you will have riches in heaven and come be my disciple. Side with my party. Follow me. But the young man heard this. He went away sad, grieved, and in much distress for he had great possessions. The pearl of great price. There is a price to pay for serving God. And that is you die to your life and you serve him. That's the price. 
It doesn't mean you're going to be a pauper the rest of your life. It just means that you have a heart adjustment. You're not worried about you. You're worried about him. He is the pearl of great price. Let's go to Mark chapter 8. Mark 8, 34 and 35. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said to them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Yeshua's not even been to the cross yet. But he knows he's going there. And here he is, he's saying, he's saying to them, if you want to be his disciple, if you want to follow him, come and deny yourself, take up your cross. What is your cross? Whatever it is that you have to bear. And follow me. And again, he's talking about losing your life. If you try to save your life, you'll lose it. You see, if he would have tried to save his life from the cross, he would have lost it. But instead, he denied himself and he said, Father, not my will, but yours. And he went to the cross. And he died on the cross. But after three days, he arose again and he is alive. He overcame death and destruction. He lost his life, but he gained life. The kingdom of God is a pearl of great price. Are you willing to sell your life? Are you willing to sell out so that you gain your life? Bear your cross. You see, we've all been predestined. We have all have a reason and a purpose. The reason I'm here is not the reason you're here. And the reason you're here is not the reason I'm here. You have a different cross to bear than I do. And Yeshua said, if you'll follow me, deny yourself. Deny your selfish, religious wants. Take up your cross and follow him. Go to Mark 10, verse 20 through 22. And he answered and said to him, Master, this again is that young, rich young ruler. He said, Master, I have observed from my youth all these things. He had grown up in the church. He had grown up in the church. He knew. He knew when it was time to light the candles. He knew when it was time to stand, stand up and sing a song. He knew when it was time for the prayer. He knew all the order within the church. He had kept all the commandments. He was a holier than thou, righteous, religious, Look at 21. And Yeshua beholding him loved him. Do you understand that Yeshua loves us despite our wretchedness? He loves us. 
He looked at him and he loved him. And he said, one thing you lack. Just one thing. You only lack one thing. What is it tonight that God would say to you, you lack this one thing? To go thy way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come and take up thy cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying. Went a great way grieved for he had great possessions. What is, what is it that God is demanding of you? I think I've shared with you before when I was, I was uh, in my 20s and I loved to knit. I'd learned to knit when I was in fourth grade and I'd been knitting ever since. And I could sit down and I could knit a scarf or a hat in one day. And I mean, I was a knitting machine. I had boxes of yarn and I just loved to knit. It was relaxing to me to knit. I could knit and watch TV. I could knit and read a book. And I loved to knit. And I remember one day as I was praying, I felt that God was telling me to gather up all my yarn and give it away. Now, my husband was a student in seminary at the time. We didn't make enough money to buy potato chips or candy. I, I shopped the outside edges of the grocery store, no prepackaged anything. I made everything from scratch and, and we bought we bought the cheapest, and I was always looking for the sales. We were on a student salary. And, and this yarn, I, I would find yarn on sale, and I would save up to get it so that when it was on sale, I could buy it. And some of it I had, had gathered up for years before I was even married. And God's saying, I want you to gather up your yarn and give it all away, and I want you to put down the knitting needles. But God, they relax me. And God, that's, that's a lot of money. Silence. Go and sell what you have. Take up your cross and follow me. So I boxed up my yarn. I had lots of yarn, a lot more yarn than I realized. And I began to take the yarn to, to, the, to the ladies within the church that I knew crocheted or knitted or would use it. And each one that I took a box of yarn to was like, why are you doing this? Why are you giving this yarn to me? And I said, well, God told me to give away my yarn, put my knitting needles down. And they're like, what's wrong with knitting? I'm like, nothing. Well, should we stop knitting? I said, only if God tells you to. You see, not knitting was my cross at that time. That was the cross I had to bear. I had to give up knitting. It wasn't easy. So I gave away my yarn. And now I'm like, God, what am I going to do with my spare time? My husband's gone four days a week. And three nights, 
It's just me here in this house by myself, four hours away from family. What am I going to do with my spare time, God? I, I can't knit anymore. What am I supposed to do? Take up your cross and follow him. Lose your life and you will gain it. Keep your life and you will lose it. You see, my life was knitting. And I had to lose it to gain life. God put a drive in me to begin to study his word. And I began to study his word with the same ambition and drive that I had been knitting. I can remember there was a point after I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I can remember I didn't know anything about fasting. But I was so driven studying and, and writing out scriptures and, and looking in the chord cordons and doing words, word studies that I just didn't even want to take time to eat. And my husband was gone, so I'd make up a tuna salad and I'd eat tuna salad and crackers because I could still study while I ate. Like I said, I was in my 20s. But you see, God knew. God knew that later on, I would have children. And when you have children, as a parent, you are responsible to take care of them. And I couldn't lock myself in a room and study for hours when I had children. But at that point in time in my life, I didn't have to for three for four days, I didn't have to feed anybody but me. I didn't, have to, I didn't have to take care of my husband. He was gone to school. I had no responsibilities but my self-care. And God was like, now is the time for you to be studying. I didn't even know why. Didn't even know why. But I began to study his word. I began to eat of it day and night. And I would study. And that went on for, for over a year. After I married Prophet Deckard, He looked at me and he said, do you understand that was an appointed time for you to study? Do you understand had you not spent that time devouring God's word? He said, it is amazing to me how much of God's word you know. I'm like, well, there's a lot of it I don't know. But he said, you know so much because you took that time and you studied it. You see, I found the pearl of great price. And I had to sell all my yarn, except I gave it away. I gave it away. If you want to follow me, deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. God knew what I was predestined to be. God knew the plan that he had for me down the road. I didn't know. 
But God was looking at me just like Yeshua looked at that rich young ruler and he was saying, one thing thou lackest. You spend all this time knitting to relax. You need to be studying my word because I have plans for you. And now is the time, now is the best time for that to happen. Do I study today? Yes, I do. But do I study like that? No, I can't. I have responsibilities with the ministry. I have things I have to do that I don't, I don't have four days straight to just study and do nothing else. But I can block off times. I, and sometimes I... Sometimes what I block off doesn't feel like enough. <coughs> but the foundation is there. <coughs> Sorry. He said, if you will come after me, deny yourself. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Your cross may not be giving up knitting. You see, today my cross is not giving up knitting. That's not my cross. That, that was a cross back then. I have a new cross today. I have something new that God's saying, I want that out of your life. Sacrifice that. Die to that. And sometimes it's a tug of war. I don't want to give it up. But I don't want to walk away like that rich young ruler being sorrowful either, do I? I have to be willing to give it up. You see, it's the willing and the obedient that eat the good of the land. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 26 through 28. <clears throat> you believe me not. Because you are not my sheep. As I have said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they will never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. If you believe not, because you are not my sheep. He said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. Do you know that God is speaking to you? Do you know his voice? And I'm not talking about hearing an audible voice. You see, God is always trying to communicate with you. And he will try different ways to communicate until one of the times you recognize it's God. And when that happens, 
He's like, okay. They understood that was me. And he will repeatedly communicate with you in that same way. Because he knows you understand that's him. You see, the way that God communicated with Prophet Deckard was not the way that God communicates with me. Does that mean it's wrong the way he communicates with me? No. God communicates with me the way I understand that it's him. How do you know, Sister Donna, that it's him? Because when I do what it is that I thought he was saying to do, it works out. And it has, it has been proven down through the years when God said, Put the knitting needles down and give away your yarn. There were many people who tried to convince me that I didn't hear God. But I did hear God. I did. And God still speaks to me in that same way because he's like, she recognized it. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. God says, come on, over here. I want you to begin to keep Shabbat. Come on, over here. You need to produce the fruit of patience. Come on, over here. You need to get the malice out of your life. Come on, over here. You're not submissive to your husband. Come on, over here. You need to tithe. God said, my sheep hear my voice. He said, if you do not believe, it's because you're not my sheep. You're not a sheep. What, I, well, what am I, Sister Donna? Well, Prophet did, Prophet did this sermon, you know, of, and he wrote a book about sheep, goats, and wolves. But you can be a sheep. You can become a sheep. You see, when Yeshua talked to that rich young ruler, it said he looked at him and he loved him because he could have become a sheep that day. He could have heard what Yeshua was saying and he could have went, yes, Lord. I just wanted to know what one thing I needed to do. Yes, I'll go do it. but he dug in his heels. He locked his knees. And he said, no, I can't do that. I have to knit, God. Let me tell you something. Giving up knitting was a very, 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 very minor thing in my life. But at the time, it was huge. It was major. It was major. I remember even saying, God, could I keep the needles? I had an investment in needles. I had, I had every size of needed knitting needle they make at that time. I said, God, can I keep the needles? And he said, sure. But I bet he laughed. As he said, sure. Because I've never knitted again. Oh, I've, I've gotten the needles out to teach my girls how to knit. But I have never had the passion and the desire to knit that I had back then. Why? Because my passion and desire changed. It changed. 
You see, God doesn't demand us to give something up for naught. But are we willing when we see the pearl of great price? You see, I didn't know what lied ahead for me. I had no idea. I had no clue. Years later, God gave me a vision. I didn't even know it was a vision. Of what my ministry would be. Years after I gave up the knitting. We have a purpose. You have a purpose and a reason. But you have to be willing to hear his voice and follow him. You have to be willing if he says, do this to do it. Just because he told the rich young ruler, sell all you have, give it to the poor and come follow me, doesn't mean that's what you're supposed to do. You bear your cross. You do what it is he's telling you to do. Maybe he's telling you Okay, you pray once a day. I want you to start praying twice a day. Okay, you're fasting one day a week. I want you to fast too. You see, it's, it's listening to his voice and doing what he says. The merchant. When he found that pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. What about you tonight? Let's pray. There's somebody that God has been dealing with you. And you, you think it's God, but you're not sure. And you've been on the fence. You're like, maybe it was, maybe it isn't. I don't know. Well, just do it and find out. Just go ahead and do it and find out. You see, you have to make a decision. You either don't do it or you do it. But I want you to stop and think about the things in the past when God dealt with you. Is it the same way that he dealt with you in the past? And if it is, you can know it's him again. There's somebody else God's been dealing with you and you have been using the excuse, well, I'm not sure if it's God because you don't want to do it. And you're using that as an excuse. I don't want to do it, but maybe it's just not God. And you know it's God. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. God loves you. 
He loves you. He's not going to demand you do something that's going to ruin you. He knows the future. Now I want to pray for those of you who are sick. There's somebody, you've got something going on in, in, your, in your mouth. You've got, you got a sore, something's going on in, in your mouth. It might, may, it might be your tongue. God's going to heal that. Yay! Yay! In the name of Yeshua! Be healed. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And if you have a need somewhere else, put your hand wherever it is. Satan, I bind you! And I command... You take your lying symptoms and leave their body. They're healed from the top of their head to the tip of their toes. I speak to the joints. I speak to the muscles. And I command you to be healed. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now, those of you that God's been dealing with you, And you haven't sold out to him. I want you to pray after me. Father, forgive me. Forgive me for my selfishness. Forgive me, Father, for trying to save my life. Father, I will take up my cross. And I will follow you daily. In the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. And amen. Well, I want to thank each of you for tuning in. And I want to remind you that with God, all 